الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئة أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته May Allah reward all of you uh, for attending and inshallah this is the last of our meetings uh, in this great course on the leaders of the women in heaven. It has been, alhamdulillah, I think, hopefully edifying for us. And it should be because we are living in a world where people prefer to gratify more than they prefer to edify. There is more of uh, uh, indulgence than there is on transcendence. And in this respect, in light of the Islamic ethos of learning, uh, when we discuss and we learn and we read and we relate and we account the stories of the great ones who came before us, then there should be a profound sense of um, self-reflection and there should be an internalizing. So when we discuss, for example, the life, lives of Maryam and Khadija and Asya and now, Mar- and now Fatima, may Allah be pleased with all of them, um, then there should be a, a mechanism inside of us uh, that is uh, goading us, pushing us towards emulation, towards practice, towards imitation, towards copying. And that's the whole reason why we do this. It is not simply for the purpose of, like they would say, the hikayat of salihin going over the tales of stories of those who are pious before us. It is something that transcends that in that we would want to actualize the things that we learn. Today, inshallah, we are uh, going to cover, inshallah, in the brief time we have together, the life of um, a tremendously great individual, Fatima al zahra known as Al-Butul, known as the one who was chaste, Fatima, the one who was known as al tahira the one who was known as pure, and Fatima bint Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course, we begin from where we always begin. And that is the famous hadith when the Prophet of Allah said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kathir, walam yakmul minan nisa illa. That he said, sallallahu alayhi wa that many men reached a completion, but the women who reached completion were uh, Maryam bint Imran, Maryam, Bint Imran and Asya, Imrat Fir'aun, and Asya, the wife of Fir'aun, and Khadija to Bint Khawailid, Khadija, the daughter of Khawailid, the wife of the Prophet of Allah, وسلم, and Fatima Bint Muhammad, وسلم, and Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad. وسلم. And so she was one of those four who had this privilege of being the leaders of the women in heaven. And concerning Fatima, also leader of the women, of all the women, uh, of the believers, of all the women, of the mu'mineen. And this is specific attribute concerning Fatima, alayhi salam. There is nothing wrong with us saying, alayhi salam, by the way. And I know that because of uh, political stuff that happens in our world, in our uh, modern day, there is a disinclination for us to... Uh, you know, we, we have radiallahu anhum, anha, and you know, and, and then we have alayhi salam, or alayhi salam, Imam Muslim in his Sahih would say Fatima alayhi salam. And he wasn't the only one, Imam Bukhari, the same. And many of the muhaddithin, the same. Because they were living in a climate that they were not so uh, stuck in straight jackets that they had to watch their words. We sadly are confined, restricted like that. In any case, we can say radiallahu anha, we can say alayhi salam, it makes no difference to us. We go back and we remember the words of our great Imam al-Shafi'i rahmatullah alayhi when he said, Ya ahli bayti rasulillah, hubbukum fardun min Allahi fil Qur'ani anzalahu yakfikum min azim al-fakhri annakum man lam yusalli alaykum la salata lahu. Oh, family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hubbukum fardun min Allahi fil Qur'ani anzalahu. Your love for you is mandated, obligation from the Qur'an that Allah revealed. 
يَكْفِيكُمْ مِنْ عَظِيمِ الْفَخْرِ It is enough of pride for you, O family of the Prophet. مَنْ لَمْ يُصَلِّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَا صَلَاةَ لَهُ Whoever does not send uh, uh, salutations to you, he has no prayer. Because we know five times a day we say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad. Oh Allah, send uh, peace and blessings and, and salutations upon Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. Kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. In that respect, there is, can, this because since Fatima of course is a valued and valuable member of the household of the Prophet of Allah, there is nothing preventing us sending salutations upon her. Uh, and her progeny. We, um, we begin, in fact, let's begin by first discussing the great importance of the Ahlul Bayt, of the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, it is important for us, of course, to take this, uh, put this in perspective because there is so much deviation and there is so much ghulu and so much extreme and so much of... Um, uh, we're really going to extremes in this. It is important for us. Allah says in the Quran, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَى لِتَكُونِ شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ We have made you a balanced nation. We have made you a middle nation. أُمَّةً وَسَطَى A middle nation. So that you become witnesses unto mankind. So we take the road that is in the middle. We take the balanced perspective, the balanced road. We are not like the Yahud or the, or the Christians, Nasara. This is why we pray, we say all the time in our salawat, غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. We ask Allah for the Sirat al Mustaqim, not the way of those who have uh, gone astray, the way of those who have earned Allah's anger, nor the way of those who have gone astray before us. And the Prophet of Allah himself in the hadith, he said that those who earned Allah's anger were the Jews, and those who simply went astray were the Christians. We are not of the extremes of the Jews or of the Christians. And this is something important for us to reflect upon, bearing in mind many parts of this Ummah will fall into the trappings of becoming like the Jews and becoming like the Christians. This is why Imam uh, Shibli and others, they would say, for example, that the likeliness of Ali radiallahu an is like the example of Isa alayhi salam, like the example of Jesus alayhi salam. Why? They said, for example, أَحِبَّهُ قَوْمًا حَتَّى هَلَكُوا فِي حُبِّهِ وَأَبْغَضَهُ قَوْمًا حَتَّى هَلَكُوا فِي بُغْضِهِ That he was loved by a people until they were destroyed in their love for him. And he was despised by a people until they were despised in their hate for him. And so the point is, each of these sides went to an extreme in loving him, over loving him, and went to extreme in, in hating him, despising him. But our perspective, of course, is the middle ground. We do not deify him. We do not raise his rank above that that is stipulated from the Quran and the Sunnah. But neither do we ever demean. Neither do we ever lower the status or the rank of those who were raised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Um, Fatima, of course, was the daughter of Khadija, radiallahu anha. And we have already spoken about Khadija, radiallahu anha. We've spoken about her greatness. And I can't remember if we spoke about her children uh, at, in the one of the months that we, we spoke about her and her virtues and her significance in Islam. Um, one of her daughters, of course, was Fatima. But Fatima was not the only daughter. She had other daughters. She had Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum and Zainab. And she had sons, Abdullah and Ibrahim. And Al-Qasim was the only son who was the son of Maria Kuptiya, the later wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we do not therefore believe that Fatima was the only daughter. He had other daughters also who married other great companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the Quran, in Surah Al-Ahzab, He mentions in a verse uh, initially and specifically addressed to the wives of the Prophet of Allah, Ya Nisa and Nabi, O wives of the Prophet, you are not like other women. You are not like other women. And then during uh, going down in that verse, Allah says, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهَ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ وَرِدْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَّهِرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهَ Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants 
Allah wants to remove impurities from you, Ahl al Bayt. Now, rids means many different things. One of the definitions of rids is impurities, one is shuk, one is doubt. Um, Allah removes uh, uncleanliness from them. And Allah wants to give you a, a complete purification. Now, and then the ayah continues. There were occasions when the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in a very famous incident of the Hadith al Kisa, the the Hadith of the of the cloak. Once the Prophet of Allah was wearing a cloak, and inside that cloak came Ali radiallahu an, and also came Hassan his son, and Hussein his other son, and then Fatima his daughter, and then the Prophet of Allah closed it like this. And then he recited this verse, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ مُرِدْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to remove impurities from you, O Ahl al-Bayt, and give you a, a complete purification. Now we do not believe this means perfection. We don't believe anybody achieves that perfection except the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It does not mean they become infallible. In fact, there are you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, uh, in, in, in quite similar wordings, for example, when He says subhanahu wa ta'ala, يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ يُذِبَ يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you, and يَتُوبَ alaykum to forgive you. Allah wants that you turn in repentance to Him. يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants and you khafifa ankum wa khulq al insanu daifa. Allah wants to make things easy for you and to and human beings were created weak. Allah in the Quran says, Khud min amwalim sadaqa to tahiruhum wa tu zakihim biha. Take from their money sadaqa, charity that will purify them therein. That will purify and that will you know, make them good there. It does not mean that these acts of worship allow us to achieve perfection. It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that Allah has, ke- Allah has kept them away from sin, away from transgression. This is a noble attribute of the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Does not mean perfection like the Prophets of Allah have Perfection. That is important for us to, to first establish. There were other times, for example, when the Prophet of Allah would leave his house to pray Fajr in the masjid. He would pass by the house of Fatima and Ali radiallahu anhuma, and he would say, As-salah ya ahl al-bayt. As-salah, O family of the o household. Ahl al-bayt is the family of the house, the household. We also believe from Ahl Sunnah this is not restrictive of only the ones that we've mentioned. It can also include the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There are, for example, in the Quran, let's take the example of Ibrahim Alayhi Salam and Sarah. The incident when the angel came and gave the glad tidings to Ibrahim and Sarah of the birth of Ishaq Alayhi Salam. And then Sarah was so amazed because she was so old. And Ibrahim Alayhi Salam was also so old. And then what do we have? Warahmatullahi wa barakatuhu ahl al bayt. Innahu hamidun majid. And the mercy of Allah and the blessing upon you, ahl al bayt, family of the house. Uh, and that was only Sarah. That was only the wife of Ibrahim, the Prophet, alayhi salam. And there was no children present there. Which means, of course, that it can include also others. You also have, for example, early on, just the reference of Ahl, when Allah says in the Qur'an, uh, um, uh, what does Allah say in the Qur'an? وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْتَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا Allah says, command your family to pray and to be consistent in the prayer. And that was only Khadija who was present at that early time of Islam, radiallahu anha. And Allah is commanding her with that. So we say that the family of the Prophet of Allah وسلم, in these hadith are these four individuals, five including the Prophet of Allah. But it does not mean that it's restricted only to them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows best. If we look at the early life of Fatima alayhi salam, uh, we know that one of the, the, uh, the first incidents that maybe a lot of us know about is the uh, time 
during the uh, great slander and the campaign against our Prophet Wasallam, where they would abuse him and they would taunt and they would swear at him and that they would push him and they would abuse him and his few companions. Um, we know that once when he was praying at the Kaaba and Abu Jahl comes along and he has the intestines of a camel, the insides of a camel. And he, when the Prophet of Allah was not looking at him, he throws them on the back of the Prophet of Allah. And they were so heavy and they were so filthy. And the one who goes to the Prophet of Allah وسلم, and remove those, that filth from him was none other than Fatima. Was none other than Fatima. So one of the first things, clear things that we learn about Fatima is her courage, is her bravery. This was not a woman who was uh, apathetic. This was not a woman who was uh, so defeated in herself, knowing of course how hard things are in her society. No, this was a woman who believed in her father. She believed, she had yaqeen, she had iman. She understood what heaven meant and what hell meant. She understood that the road that we're traversing is a difficult one and it's a perilous one. And it's one full of trials and difficulties. And she pursued that path together with her mother Khadija and her father Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Remarkable. We, we don't see only this. We find other examples, for example, too many examples there. Uh, <laughs> the occasion during the Battle of Khandaq. In the Battle of Khandaq, when... Uh, the Prophet ﷺ and his companions had, had, had nothing to eat. And they were so hungry. And Fatima comes along. I know I'm skipping because this is later on. But just to establish the point of her help and the defense of the Ummah. She comes along and she, uh, she has uh, bread, few pieces of bread with her. And the Prophet of Allah asks her, she said, Ya Fatima, ma hadi? what is this, O Fatima? And Fatima says, um, this is min qirsin ikhtabastuhu li ibni. This is like a, 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 a small piece of bread, food that I have that I was cooking for my son, one of her children. And she said, so I, I brought it along. I took it from him. Fajituka minhu. I brought it to you from him. And then the Prophet of Allah says, Ama innaha la awwal ta'am dakhla fam abik mundu thalat. Indeed, this is the first food that has entered the mouth of your father for three days. The first food that your father is eating in three days. And so we see therefore compassion. It is not in our world what are we confronted with. And this is not only an advice for our sisters, although maybe specifically it is because Fatima was a, a noble woman, but for all of us, what are we confronted with? We lose in our world those ethics of courage and those ethics of compassion. I don't mean like just compassion when you know you're, yeah, that's you know where you've come from, so you're going to feel sorry. No, it means not only moral compassion. It means moral consistency, not just moral compassion, moral consistency. We would be consistent in our uh, not only grieving but our uh, acting out, our helping, and our assistance. And this is a remarkable quality of, of a Muslim, particularly in the age and day in which we are living. Fatima illustrated that, she demonstrated that, alayhi salam, in the way that she would seek to defend the Prophet of Allah from those who would curse, from those who would abuse, from those who would seek to inflict injury on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. Fatima was, was known for that. And even, let's take another in, in, example, the Battle of Uhud. As you know, the Mushrikeen, they had outset the Battle of Uhud for themselves as a revenge for the battle of defeat at the Battle of Badr. And so they prepared a very large army and they come along. And the Prophet of Allah himself in that battle was wounded. And his jaw was smashed in, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And his tooth was broken. And he was bleeding from his face, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Right? But we know from, the, from our hadith, يَجِئُوا um, that Ali radiallahu an يَجِئُوا بِتَرْسِهِ فِيهِ مَاءٌ وَفَاطِمَةُ تَغْسِلُ عَنْ وَجْهِهِ الدَّمْ That Ali, the, 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 the husband of Fatima, the cousin of the Prophet of Allah وسلم, comes along and he has a bowl and in it was water. 
And so he brings it along, but the one who was wiping the blood from the face of the Prophet was none other than Fatima. Fatima is wiping the blood away from the face of the Prophet ﷺ. So think about that. We have of course many examples during the, the, battle, the battles of, of Islam and the Muslimin, when the women would come along and they would be nurses and they would help. May Allah reward the many sisters who have traveled from here all the way to lands like Bilad Sham, Syria or other places and they're acting as, and they're medics. Wallahi brings you so much happiness and joy. And these are young people. Allah put inspiration for all of us. In many of the universities in this country, many of the Islamic societies, young people who are studying medicine have gone all the way to, to Syria and other places and they're helping, helping the injured and the wounded and those who are between life and death. I mean, what a great thing to do. We, we always remember what the Prophet of Allah taught us when he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the man came upon him and he said, uh, uh, Which people are the most beloved people to Allah? And then the Prophet of Allah says, nasi ilallah and fa'uhum linnas, The most beloved people to Allah are those who bring the most benefit to people. Are those who bring the most benefit to people. And always have that in your mind. That that's what I want to do in my life. I want to benefit other people. Not just about that we would, of course, want to be the best worshippers. But also that we would want to be servants of Allah's creation. Be like servants. Help people. Assist people. Be clement and kind and compassionate and giving and helping. These are all attributes of a Muslim. And Sahaba, they would seek that out. And here we have remarkably demonstrated in the daughter of the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he would assist, uh, sorry, she would assist and she would uh, help. We also know, look at the, the, the thing about struggle and difficulty and trials. How during the boycott against the Prophet of Allah, sallam, remember that Fatima was also there. And so when the Prophet and his few a group of followers and his family are expelled and they're thrown out of Mecca and they lived in those situations, circumstances for three years. Fatima is also there. Khadija is also there. His family is also there. And she must have been a very small girl. But look at the, the, uh, the principles of bravery and sacrifice that she has learned, she's witnessing and seeing from her father and those who are around him. What kind of things do you think we should be teaching our young people today? Those of us who are fathers, or those of us who are mothers, what are we leaving behind for our children? I think one of the most important things is that we would raise them to be brave and courageous. And I don't mean that in some kind of a exotic sense of the term, that we think yeah, brave means that he's going to carry a shield and a sword with him and go and fight. No, it doesn't only mean that. It means even in normal life situations, that we would learn to put our egos beside us or behind us. We would learn to quash our egos because our egos are almost a buffer that come in between us and uh, bravery for the sake of Allah. Because if we are fighting wars of, or battles of egos, it means that we don't seek Allah. It means we seek ourselves. It means we seek ourselves. But if we learn to quash this and put Allah before us, then we put Allah before us. And that's the key thing. So learn to be brave and courageous. And of course, bravery and courage is uh, implemented and acted out differently depending on the circumstance. Like when the Prophet of Allah says that the brave one out of you, the strong one is not the one who is so tough and good at wrestling, but the strong one out of you is the one man yamliku nafsa wa al ghadab, who can control himself in a moment of anger. That even that is courage and bravery because you are not allowing yourself, your nafs, your inner self, to dictate what is uh, what should happen. It is not about your nafs anymore. It is about what is most pleasing to Allah. And then in other circumstances, you would never allow yourself or others to become bullied or to become victims of transgression or oppression. You would want to assist and help uh, and sacrifice for those who are 
suffering in, in our world or in our community or, or where, wherever, wherever that could be. And that is the key thing for us to remember. Uh, she, of course, was the daughter of Khadija also, radiallahu anha. And we know how much Khadija suffered. We know about that. We know how she was so wealthy and she had so much. And during the, 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 the class we had together on Khadija, we went through all of this. How she had so much, but she just gave up so much. And she lived without life of frugality. She could have had so much because she was so wealthy, but she gave up all of that in favor of Islam and her, her husband, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu And so when Khadija died... When she passed away in the Am al Husn, in the year of grief, when Khadija passed away, and then you know Abu Talib, he also died in the same year, and it was uh, a very difficult blow to the uh, you know to the morale of the Muslims because they had lost. Uh, Khadija was most beloved to them; they loved her. She was the mother. Uh, she was the wife of the Prophet, the only wife of the Prophet of Allah at that time. And then Abu Talib, who was not a Muslim, but he was a defender and supporter of the faith. And they lost both of them. Imagine how that must have affected uh, Fatima. But the one who could console her was none other than her, her father, the Prophet ﷺ. And he would remind her. And the Muslims were reminded. And we are reminded today about Khadija and her significance, of course, when the, the famous incident when the Prophet was alone with Jibreel alayhi salam, and he says to the Prophet of Allah, Hadi Khadija, this is Khadija coming to you, and she has a bowl of food. And when she comes, give her the glad, give her the salam, uh, my salam and the salam of her Lord. Allah's salutations to her. And this is the thing that really upped the spirits of Fatima when she heard this and reheard this when she had when her mother had died, when the Prophet when Jibreel says to the Prophet of Allah, Wabashir habi baitin fil jannah min qasab la saqab fiha wa la nasab and give Ha, Khadija, the glad tidings of a palace in paradise made of pearls. And there would be no noise in that place and no turmoil, no difficulties in that place. And from this, of course, we, we learn the principle, al jazau min jins al-amal, that the recompense is based upon the good that we do in this life. The good that we do, that's how Allah recompenses for us in the next life. And that's something that Fatima, of course, knew about her mother, Khadija radiallahu anha. Fatima also migrated to Medina along with all the others. So when we go over the accounts and the narrations of how difficult that journey must have been, and of course it was, remember that Fatima in her young age was also making that journey. During the life of the Muslims in Medina, Fatima by now was growing up, alayhi salam, and, uh, and she, she is proposed to for marriage. We know that Abu Bakr radiallahu an proposes to her for marriage, but that was not accepted. Umar proposes to her for marriage radiallahu an, but that was not accepted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had intended for Fatima Ali radiallahu an. And this was a remarkable thing actually. Because if you see the dynamics of the relationship between Fatima and Ali, it is an example for all of us as husband and wife, as parents. When you look at the example that is set out for us in Fatima and Ali, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended this for both of them. And it was Ali who eventually married the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ. And remember, Ali was also a family, a member of the household. He was also there in the kisa, he was also there in the cloak. Ali was also there during the mubahala, during the uh, debate between the Muslims and the Christians. When Allah says, bring members of your family and their family, the Prophet of Allah chose and selected Fatima and Ali and Hassan and Hussein. They all came together. So Fatima and Ali were already acquainted. They knew about each other and they knew about the greatness of one another. And Ali radiallahu anhu was someone who was beloved to Allah and beloved to his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. In one hadith, the Prophet of Allah says, Anta minni wa ana mink. Anta minni wa ana mink. You are from me and I am from you. To Ali radiallahu anhu. 
Ali, in, from the hadith, from our sources, we have that the Prophet of Allah says, لا يحبك إلا مؤمن ولا يبغضك إلا منافق No one loves you except he's a believer. And no one hates you except that he's a hypocrite. So even loving and hating, therefore, is in this extent conditional upon loving and hating of Ali. And that's Iman, that's Iman. Dependent on our love and our hate, our love of Ali radiallahu an, And then the hypocrisy of those who have antagonism and hatred of him radiallahu an. In many, many, many hadith, the Prophet of Allah praised Ali radiallahu an. We know, أول من صلى مع النبي بعد خديجة علي that the first one to pray with the Prophet of Allah after Khadija was Ali radiallahu an. And remember that Ali was raised in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he would have known, he knew Fatima growing up. And the Prophet of Allah strengthened his household in, in having both of these two great individuals marry. And they had many children, as we know. From, his, from their great children, uh, were, was Hassan radiallahu an and Hussein and Muhassin Hassan and Hussein and Muhassin and Zainab and, Ulkul, and Umm Kulthum and Ruqayya these were the children of uh, Ali and Fatima now of course if we had time we could have uh, gone over a lot concerning Hassan and Hussein radiallahu anhuma salam. You know, Hassan and Hussein were again the grandchildren of the Prophet of Allah. But when we analyze and look at their greatness, we must attribute a lot of who they were to their parents. A mother specifically, Fatima and father Ali radiallahu an. That Hassan and Hussein, the Prophet of Allah says that they are the Sayyidah Shababi Ahl Jannah. These are the, the two youths of the people of heaven. The leaders of the youth in heaven are Hassan and Hussein. The Prophet of Allah would say, Oh Allah, I love them. The Prophet of Allah, when we take the hadith, when we look at the hadith about when the man Al-Aqra came from a distance, came from far, he was harsh, natured man. And the Prophet of Allah was kissing Hassan and Hussein radiallahu anhuma. And he comes along and he says, Ya Rasulullah, you kiss children. Ma nuqabbiluhum. We do not kiss children. And then the Prophet of Allah in one narration, he says, Man la yarham, la yurham. Whoever does not show mercy will not be shown mercy. Therefore, the Prophet of Allah was merciful, particularly merciful in the way that he dealt with children. And he would say, in one hadith about Hassan, the older one, Hassan was older than Hussein, Inna ibni hadha sayyid. Indeed, this my son is a leader. Of course, he was his grandson, not his son. But the Prophet is saying, no, these are my children. Inna bani hadha sayyid. Indeed, my son, this one, is a leader. And then he would, you know, we, ha- we know what happened later between Muawiyah and, uh, and, uh, and Ali radiallahu an. Right? The Prophet of Allah said, sorry, and Hassan, Hassan and, and Muawiyah, during the, the Khilafah, uh, it was Hassan who abdicated his rule. Uh, the Prophet of Allah predicted this. He prophesied this would happen and says that these two, that this young boy of mine, this leader, this son of mine is a leader who would uh, yuslihu. He would make islah. He would make rectification between, uh, 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 between two big groups amongst the Muslims. And this is exactly what happened with Hassan radiallahu an. And then we know from Hussein, and of course we've just gone over uh, the, uh, the, the, the narrative of Hussein and his martyrdom on the day of Ashura. And I've been speaking about this in a lot of my talks recently in my Jummah khutbahs. For those of you who have heard, uh, there's a lot we, we need to learn about this. And a lot of lessons we should learn from this, but I don't think we have enough time right now. Uh, to go into this, but let it be said that it was a great, great injustice against the family of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that we declare our love for Hussein radiallahu an, but also for his father Ali, and we do not, you know, I think there is, well, no, I don't think I know there is uh, a going to extremes in this. How and why? Because what tends to happen is that what, what has happened is that we have made the exception into a rule. 
And it was the Christians who made the exception into the rule. They took the example of Isa alayhi salam, the way that they interpreted his life, and they say he was crucified, we don't believe that. But they made him exceptional as a prophet, and we believe he was exceptional as a prophet, and they made him into a rule. Everything therefore was bound by a narrative of sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb. This is how they perceive of Jesus. What's happened today with Hussein radiallahu an is that the same thing has happened. Is that he becomes like a sacrificial lamb. He becomes like, uh, you know, Hussein becomes the, the doorway, the gateway. Everything, all Islam is about the life of Hussein. And that is not to demote, that is not to undermine his great significance and relevance, but that is simply to stipulate we do not go to an extreme in that. What we say is that those who killed him were the wrongdoers, were the oppressors. And even our ulama like Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, Lanatullah ala man qatal al Hussein, may the curse of Allah be on those who killed Hussein. Woman radiya bihi, and those who were pleased with the killing of, of Hussein. We have no problem in saying that. But we don't make our whole life about one example, one case of a martyrdom, because those who were martyred before him are even greater than him, like his father. Ali was also martyred, radiallahu an. Right? Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet of Allah, was also martyred. But we don't have the same uh, ceremonies and whatever, you know, for those individuals. It shows that there is some kind of a, you know, where going astray in this. And this is the danger we seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, one thing that we learn is that we see how Ali radiallahu an and his wife Fatima lived a life of frugality. And this is a key point for us to bear in mind here because if there are lessons, and I've said this before, that we should be taking from the month of Ramadan and other times of the year, great times of the year like the days of Dhul Hijjah, or even if we look at the example of the martyrdom of Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam, then we would know that our perspective as Muslims is that we would learn to put frugality over greed. We would learn to put self-sacrifice over self-interest. We would learn to put contentment over, ex- over extravagance and greed and these kinds of things. So frugality is the norm of the Muslims. Why do you think there is so much discontent and dissatisfaction today? When you think, uh, you know, I speak of myself, I don't, I speak of myself, but maybe you could relate to this, that when we think, you know what, we have so much work to do as Muslims, we have so much da'wah, we have so much activism, we have so much campaigning, we have so much work to do, but we're always dissatisfied, we're always discontent, we, we have been sucked into the trappings of wanting more, of the branding corporations and advertising and public relations and marketing, you know, we are, we are coming off the same uh, conveyor belt. The Prophet's daughter Fatima was not like that. In fact, there was an incident when Fatima and Ali, they both go to Prophet and say, Ya Rasulullah, we need a servant. We need a servant. Right? Because your things are becoming so hard in the house. And they were both work. They were try hard. You know, they would go to the, to the wells to bring the water, they would make the bread themselves, and they said, Ya Rasulullah, we need a maid, we need a servant. And the Prophet then taught them and taught all of us, Wallahi brothers, practice this. He said, Should I not direct you both to something that is better than what you've both asked me? What is it? He said to them, Fasabbiha. Thalathan wa thalathin. Wahmada. Thalathan wa thalathin. Wa kabbira. Arbaan wa thalathin. Ida akhaztuma madajakuma. Fasabbiha. Thalathan wa thalathin. Wahmada. Thalathan wa thalathin. Wa kabbira. Arbaan wa thalathin. Thawa khir lakuma min khadim wa kama kal sallallahu alayhi salam. He says, When you guys go to bed, when you go to bed, when you sleep, when you're before you sleep and you go to your bed, then glorify Allah, say subhanallah 33 times. And then say alhamdulillah 33 times. And then say Allahu Akbar 34 times. And that is better for you than a servant. Better for you than a servant. Subhanallah. I mean, think about the implications of this. Ali radiallahu anhu says, I never left this. 
They said to him, not even on the, during the battle of Sifid, the famous big battle. He said, not even on the night of Sifid did I leave this dua that the Prophet of Allah taught us to read. So of course, we know that we would read this after our daily prayers, but also before we sleep, we read this. And then you would see the difference it makes in your life. The Prophet was telling them that it's going to make a difference in your life because it's better for you than having a servant. Meaning you would become more proactive, you could do more, Allah places more barakah, blessing in your time. And this is something that we learn from uh, Fatima and her, her husband. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu he honored Fatima. He honored Fatima. And we learn a lot of this honoring is narrated to us from Umm al muminin Aisha radiallahu anha. And that is important for us to say. Why? Because those on the extreme end of, of things, they love, to, uh, they love to slander and they curse. And it seems as if the whole religion is about processes of slandering and cursing and slandering and cursing where subhanallah, that is not the way of a Muslim. It was on the authority of Aisha. And I'll tell you something, there is a lot that comes about the Ahlul Bayt on the authority of Aisha radiallahu anha. And even if you do not accept, they do not accept the significance of Aisha as a member of the household, it should not make a difference. Allah in the Quran says, that indeed, The Prophet of Allah is more preferable to yourselves and his wives are your mothers. His wives are your mothers. We call them Ummahatul Mu'mineen. These are the mothers of the believers. Including Aisha radiallahu anha as a mother of the believers. It was from Aisha when they came along and they said they had a question about the mas'h al khafain about wiping over the socks for wudu. They had a question. And Aisha says to them, I'ti ibn Abi Talib, bring Ibn Abi Talib, meaning bring Ali. Why? Because Fa'inu can you suffer ma an Nabi? He used to travel with the Prophet of Allah in one narration for Wa'alam bi dalika minni. He's more knowledgeable about that question than I am. And you think, what happened to this, uh, the great and, and perpetual antagonism and hatred that's played out between Aisha and the family of the Prophet ﷺ? No, they were honored and they were respected by all of the great companions. Abu Bakr would honor the family of the Prophet ﷺ. We know, for example, Abu Bakr once he came upon uh, Ali was with Hassan, his son, his older son. And they come along, and Ali says to uh, the father, Shabihu bin Nabi wa laysa shabihan bi abihi. He looks so much like he, the Prophet, doesn't seem to look like his father. Meaning, he's, he's saying to Ali, He doesn't look like you, he looks more like the Prophet. Right? Wa Ali yadhak, and Ali began to laugh. Right? When Umar ibn Khattab became Khalifatul Mu'mineen, Muslimin, he. Uh, he, uh, they would say to him when he was distributing the wealth, Ibda binafsik, start with yourself. Come on, you take some money first. He says, no. Abda bil awwa, bil akrab, fal akrab. I will begin with those who are close and then those who are close. He began with Abbas and then Ali. Beginning with the family of the Prophet of Allah, during times of a drought, he would ask Abbas, the, from the family of the Prophet of Allah, to recite, the, to pray the, uh, the rain prayer. Giving pride of place to them. It was Abu Huraira. It was others like him. Kashif and Sadr al Hussein, Hassan, that he uh, took off the, 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 removed the gum from the chest of Hassan or Hussein. Faqabbala when he kissed him. Wabak and he cried and he says, I saw the Prophet of Allah doing the same. They had love for the family of the Prophet. And so we know that Fatima was honored. And one of the narrations is coming from who? Umm al Mu'mineen, Aisha radiallahu anha. She says, for example, Wallahi inni kuntu anzur ila Fatima. Wa hiya tuqbil ma tughadir. Mashatuha, mashatu Rasulullah sallam. She said, I used to look upon Fatima. And by Allah, the way she walked was the way the Prophet of Allah walked. Her walking was like the walking of the Prophet. ﷺ. And her, 
and that her speaking was only like the speaking of the Prophet ﷺ. So that means that she is the embodiment, she's emulating to such an extent that people are noticing that the way the Prophet is, is the way that Fatima is. The way that the Prophet speaks, is the way that Fatima speaks. The way that Fatima walks, is the way that the Prophet of Allah himself walks. And then she says, for example, فَيَسْتَقْبِلُهَا وَيُقَبِّلُهَا عَلَى جَبِينِهَا وَيَأْخُذْ بِيَدِهَا وَيَجْلِسُهَا فِي مَكَانِهِ That when Fatima would come, Fatima, when the Prophet of, of Allah would visit Fatima, he would stand up for her. And he would kiss her on her forehead. He would kiss her. And then he would give Fatima his seat. فَإِذَا زَارَهَا Muhammad Salam, And if the Prophet of Allah visited, قامت, she would get up. وَيَأْخُذْ بِيَدِهِ And she would take his hand. And she would kiss his hand. And she would place him on her seat. Remarkable. The way that the, the father and the daughter are teaching us about the way things should be in the home. These days, it's about lockdown. Isn't it? It's about lockdown. Isn't it? So, if the father enters, and what has to happen? Lockdown. Silence. No one can speak. Right? No one's allowed to speak. Look how the Prophet of Allah is teaching us about Rahmah. He was Rahmat al-Alameen, he was a mercy for all the worlds. How much more so than for his own children, for his own daughter. Fatima was beloved to the Prophet of Allah, beloved to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so he's teaching us, Fatima would come in, he would get up, and he would kiss her, and then he would put her where he was sitting. And if the Prophet would enter her house, she would get up, and she would kiss him, and then she would place him where she was sitting. Respect, honor, dignity. Right? That's how it should be in the home. Like very much later when Umar was Khalifa al Muslimin and he was playing with his children. His kids are playing on his stomach. And one of his wuzara, one of his governors comes in and says to Umar, You know, he ankarahad al fi'l. He didn't like what Umar was doing. He looked like. He said, what are you doing? You're supposed to be the Amir al-Mu'mineen, Khalifa al-Muslimin, and this is how you're behaving? And, uh, and Omar, he puts his kids down, he gets up, and then he says to him, the man, وَكَيْفَ أَنْتَ فِي أَهْلِكَ How do you behave with your family? He says, إِذَا دَخَلْتُ لَا يَتَكَلَّمْ أَحَدْ When I enter, no one speaks. Look down. See, no one's allowed to speak. And Omar says to him, you're removed. No longer governor anymore. Why? <coughs> if you cannot show compassion in your family, how can you show compassion in the Ummah of Muhammad ﷺ? Teaching us the ideal of warmth and compassion and softness uh, in our homes, particularly with respect to our children. And there's a lot more that can be said about what we're experiencing today in our world of... Um, of kids who, who don't have the environment in the home and they seek membership of, of groupings and gangs outside of the home because that's where they think that they have uh, protection and that's where they think that they have love and so they think that they have you know all these kind of things uh, but it should exist in the home and the way the Prophet of Allah was with Fatima exemplifies all of that we also know in the famous hadith that Fatima was a part of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, for example, in the Fatima bid'atun minni, or kamaqal, that Fatima is a part of me. And it was from this hadith that the ulama would debate who's better than who. Is Fatima, you know, better than Maryam and so on and so forth, right? And there were many, in fact, who says that no one is comparable to a part of the Prophet ﷺ. If the Prophet of Allah is the best, and then he says, Fatima is a part of me, then who could be comparable to a part of the Prophet ﷺ? In any case, some agreed, some disagreed, but that's a key thing that we learn from this hadith. Then he says, uh, you know, uh, uh, he whoever angers her, angers me. Whoever pleases her, pleases me. 
Whoever angers her, angers me. Whoever pleases her, pleases me. So we know therefore that Fatima is so specific that her happiness and her anger was linked to the anger and the happiness of the Prophet of Allah himself, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Aisha again narrated and says, radiyallahu anha, "Ma ra'aytu ahadan ashbahu." I have not seen anybody who resembles the Prophet of Allah fi qiyamiha wa qu'udiha. In her standing and in her sitting, min Fatima bint Rasulullah, more than Fatima, the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu Aisha once said, "Ma ra'aytu ahadan astaqu lahjatan." I have not seen min Fatima bint Rasulullah. I have not seen anybody more honest in speech than Fatima, the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Just saying. How many virtues, how many attributes we have of goodness, of greatness coming from this one individual, Fatima alayhi salam, radiallahu anha. That she was known for her honesty, she was known for her bravery, she was known for her piety, she was known for her sacrifice, she was known for her resemblance and imitation of the Prophet sallallahu What a remarkable role model therefore that she was. She was young. When the Prophet of Allah came towards the end of his life, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Um, and that was a very difficult moment for Fatima and, and others. Um, it was the, the hardest we have from the hadith. Um, the Prophet of Allah says, none of you is given a, a test or a trial difficulty uh, more than mine. And what that means is his death. Then he says, because that's the greatest of trials, the greatest of difficulties is the death of the Prophet of Allah wasallam. Because the effect that that had on that initial great community was uh, something that no one had seen before. They were dependent and they relied that was their prophet. That was their leader. That was their beloved, sallallahu alaihi wa wasallam. And so, just imagine how it must have felt then for Fatima. And we know, for example, during the illness of her father, um, when the prophet was very ill and he was dying, uh, Fatima exclaimed and says, "Wa karba, oh, what grief there is!" And the prophet says to Fatima. لَيْسَ عَلَىٰ بِيكَ بَعْدَ الْيَوْمِ Your father would have no grief after today. Your father will have no grief after today. Meaning, indicating to her that he would pass away. And then, when uh, Fatima was so grief-stricken, the Prophet of Allah says to her, أَلَا تَرْضَيْنَ أَن تَكُونِي أن تكوني سيدة نساء المؤمنين أو هذه الأمة. Does it not please you that you are the leader of all the believers? Does it not please you you are the leader of all believers in one nation, the leaders of the women of this Ummah? Other hadith, the other narration, the leader of all the believers. Does it not please you that you are the leader of um, all the women believers? And that you know, gave some joy to, to Fatima. When the Prophet of Allah was dying, uh, she said when he had died, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she, she says, she cried out and says, Ya Abata, Ajaba Rabban Da'a, Ya Abata, Min Janatil Firdausi Ma'wa, O Father, Ajaba Rabban Da'a, Your Lord, uh, called you and you responded Min Janatul Firdausi Ma'wa That's from heaven from Janatul Firdaus She would say for example and she, she was uh, very uh, you know if you read the accounts and you know that she was so affected that she would prefer to remain recluse in her own home she once says to Sahaba, after they had buried the Prophet of Allah, she says to Anas, Ya Anas, أَطَابَتْ أَنْفُسُكُمْ أَنْ تَحْثُوا أَتْتُرَابْ عَلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ 
أَطَابَتْ أَنفُسُكُمْ How did you guys like pluck up the courage, strength of spirit and heart that you would throw dust on the body of the Prophet ﷺ? It's something for us to think about. Imagine. They had to do, of course, what, what they had to do in, in burying the Prophet of Allah. But this is the daughter speaking and says, How did you pluck up the spirit? How did you purify yourself to that degree that you would throw dirt and dust on the, on the Prophet wasallam? And again it reflects her, the difficulty she was in. She would say, Subbat alayya masayib. Law anna subbat ala al-ayami udna al-ayaliya. She says that a difficulty has come upon me. If that difficulty came upon the day, it would turn the day into the night. Meaning that's how grief-stricken she was following the passing of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, uh, there was an incident, and again, this is coming from Aisha radiallahu anha. Where she said that she noticed Fatima um, with the Prophet of Allah when the Prophet of Allah was very, very sick, and she saw the Prophet of Allah whisper something to her, like tell her a secret. And Fabakat, uh, she said, I saw Fatima cry. And then I saw the Prophet giving her another bit of information. فضحكت. And then Fatima laughed. And uh, Aisha would petition Fatima to tell her, what, did it, what is it that the Prophet told you? Because he chose you out of everybody else, selected you. What did the Prophet tell you? And Fatima wouldn't tell her. But when the Prophet of Allah had moved on, وسلم, then Fatima told her. And Fatima says, and then the Prophet says, Fatima says to Aisha that this year, Jibreel alayhi salam came to him twice in the year to listen to his Qur'an. Previously he would come once in the year. This year he came twice in the year. And so the Prophet felt himself that he would be dying this year. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And he told that information. And so Fatima Bakat she cried when she heard that. And then she uh, told the... Uh, then she says to... Then the Prophet says to Fatima that you will be, um, you will be the, the first member of Ahli Bayti, the first member of my, my house at Ba'uhu, the first member of my house that will follow me after my death will be you. And then Fatima laughed when she heard that information, meaning it pleased her, knowing of course that she would be the first one to die from the, from the house of the Prophet after the Prophet died Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Now in conclusion I think it's important for us to mention two things Because there are two things that are uh, Points of controversy um, you know, Amongst people One is the incident When the Prophet of Allah had passed away وسلم, And uh, Fatima comes along to Abu Bakr The Khalifa Radiallahu an. And she asked for the land of Fadak. Asked for a land, the land of Fadak. Uh, so Abu Bakr, he says to her that, you know, I can't give you that land because of what I heard from the Prophet of Allah. La Nurith. You know, we do not leave behind inheritance. That our land, this is our wealth all goes for sadaqah. We don't leave behind inheritance. And then we have in one narration, again, if I remember, it's on authority of Aisha, that Fatima became upset uh, with Abu Bakr and then Fatima didn't speak to him until she died. So there are some people who like to latch on to this narration and say, see, you see, Fatima was angry and that means from the other hadith, whoever angers Fatima angers me, the Prophet says, whoever pleases Fatima pleases me. There are other narrations that we fail to consider. There is a narration uh, in Bayhaqi, there is a narration, uh, other narrations when after this incident, of course, at that moment it was very difficult because Abu Bakr was new in his Khilafah. Um, he went to the house of Fatima and Ali. You see, you got to think about 
what are we uh, ascribing or attributing to the companions of the Prophet of Allah if our reading is a very negative reading of everything? We deconstruct. And every reading we have is a negative reading. We impute upon, falsely attribute upon the Prophet's companions who he loved, very negative attributes and traits. We know that in, in normal life, between us individuals, we would make excuses for one another. The Prophet of Allah says, make up to 70 excuses for your brother. Right? Just imagine we didn't do that. You know, we'd slit the throats of, of each other. Isn't it? Get to that extent. But we know about restraint. And so, by taking one narration, there is another narration. When Abu Bakr goes to the house of Fatima, radiallahu anha, and, and he knocks on the door, and Ali uh, says to Fatima, this is uh, Fatima. This is uh, Abu Bakr ala bab. This is Abu Bakr on the door. And if you give permission, I will allow him to enter. And then she says to him, ذَلِكَ uh, أَحَبُّ إِلَيْكَ Like, is that beloved for you? To, is that good? Is that in, in your favor to do that? To enter the house? And that's of course in custom with Islam. You can't allow anybody to enter the house without having permission from your husband. And then he says, Naam, yes. So Abu Bakr enters the house. وَكَلَّمَهَا And he speaks with her. And then in the end of the narration we have that she was pleased with him. Right? You know, it is inconceivable. How could Ali then serve as a valuable member in the Khilaf of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman? Knowing of course that, that Abu Bakr is the one who angered his, his uh, wife, the daughter of the Prophet of Allah. Don't we see Ali is being courageous and brave and standing up for his rights? There's a, a long discussion here, but that's something I think we should remember. Um, and the other one, of course, is the great lie and the slander against uh, Umar radiallahu an concerning Fatima, where these individuals, they, they pluck out this one narration that's even discredited by their own group, like Ayatollah Khoi al-Khoi, and many others discredit this narration that they pluck out that says that Umar, he broke the, the door, he slammed the door against Fatima when Fatima was pregnant with Muhassan. By the way, we believe that Muhassan was born in the time of the Prophet of Allah, right? And that she had a miscarriage and the child died, right? And therefore they say, well, look at what Umar has just done, radiallahu anhu. This is a lie and a slander. And not only is this again uh, putting the, her husband Ali in such disrepute because it's saying, I mean, couldn't he defend his wife? Would he allow something like that happen if someone killed his son? Uh, would he be all cherry smiles with him? No, it's an accusation and it's a slander against him. Right? And even this is discredited by the authorities of those people themselves like Ayatollah al khoi and Fadulullah and so many others amongst them. This has no uh, um, veracity, this account in it. We know that the, um, and I have mentioned this already, that the, the Prophet's companions and the Ahlul Bayt uh, had a very good relationship. There were occasions, of course, after the death of Fatima, where some things did ensue, there were battles. But the point is this, the one thing that you would find in these accounts is that there were moments of uh, rectification, there were moments of, um, you know, of coming back together. It was not like a perpetual antagonism like other people like to, like to believe. Um, on the contrary, there was uh, great moments of, of respect and, and honoring. And the Prophet of Allah, you, could, you have the example, look at the example of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an when once he was with Muawiyah radiallahu an, and, and they were discussing, and Ibn Umar comes to them, his own son, Umar's own son radiallahu an, and he, uh, he doesn't want to interrupt because he thinks, you know, my dad's busy in, in whatever discussion he has, and so he leaves. And then Hussein comes along, or Hassan, one of them, comes along, and he sees, um, he sees what's happening because those two are discussing, and Umar's own son is kind of 
moved out, goes back, and he says, there's no use than me going to interrupt, because if his own son is not allowed to interrupt his discussion, then I, what hope will I have? That's what he's saying. Until later on, Omar asked, he says, you know, I, we saw you coming along, why didn't you come? And, he says, and then he says, because I saw what happened with your son Ibn Omar, and I saw what happened, and he says to him, he says to Hassan or Hussein, he says, he says, you know, you are more privileged than anybody else, being the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ. More privileged than anybody else. And even Abu Bakr would say similar things. That, you know, we have more love for the family of Rasulullah more than we have love for our own kith and kin. And that's really the paradigm and the ethos of the Muslims. Allah tells us in the Quran that we say, "Rabbana اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غل للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم Our Lord, forgive us and those who came before us, our brothers who came before us. And let there be no rancor and no bad feelings in our hearts for those who believe. The Prophet of Allah would say, I advise you concerning my family, in one hadith, he also said, I advise you concerning my companions. Do not make them enemies of you. Do not make them enemies of you. And so we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we don't have that malice in our hearts concerning any of them. We love all of them. And we give pride of place to the family of the Prophet ﷺ and his daughters and his grandchildren and Ali and all of them as we give importance to his companions. And we don't deconstruct along a very negative reading because that is detrimental to our own nafs and our own, our own iman. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who embody the spirit and the character of Fatim alayhi salam. This is an advice, you know, we are living very much in an age, like I mentioned, of consumerism. Like Naomi Klein said, for example, there is like this... Uh, uh, there is like this uh, glamorized uh, appeal to flawlessness. And that of course is, is on the shoulders of those who are marketing and advertising. Right? So you see these images of women, or you see these images of cosmetics and all of this. And it's like women have this ideal, no it's not an ideal, it's an image of flawlessness. But what Fatima represented was essentially the ideal. And we cannot fight ideals so not fight images against ideals. Images are built and based upon the aesthetic, are based upon something that is finite, temporary, fleeting, passing, is removed as soon as it comes on, and then something else is replaced by it. But ideals are different. Ideals are those that are recognized by achievements, whereas images are recognized by trademarks. Like people today are victims of branding corporations. And it's even true, more, when I think about when I was younger, I'm so young, but when I was... When I was younger, like the comparative superlative, you know, when I was younger in age, uh, we didn't have it as bad as people have it today. Now, in our day and age, in our world today, people have, they, they live in their kind of social economic cliques built based upon the brands that they're wearing. It's truer in America than it is here, but it's still here, right? So if you're not wearing the certain brand, you don't qualify to be in my gang. You know, if you don't wear the same perfume as I do. And you have all these kind of crazy notions. What does Fatima represent for us? I mean, not only was she the paradigm of frugality, not only that, but she taught us that the ideal is far more lasting. If we can, 1400 years after her, recount the narratives and we can live up, try and live up to the ideals of sacrifice and bravery and commitment and so on and so forth, it shows that that is lasting. That is what has remained. And that is established and built upon an achievement. May Allah make us of those who are achievers. May Allah make us of those who walk in the, same, in the footsteps of those great ones who came before us. All of these uh, great women, the leaders of the women of, of heaven, uh, Fatima and Maryam and Khadija and Asya, all of them are great. And we've learned, I think, inshallah, a lot. May Allah forgive me for the many mistakes that I might have made. May Allah forgive me for not keeping to time <laughs> sometimes. And may Allah reward all of you 
for your attendance and uh, your consistency. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all great Muslims. Um, may Allah make us active. I know I didn't get much time to speak about what I wanted to, particularly in respect to and in light of uh, Fatima and her defense of the Ummah, in her defense of the Prophet Sallam. What role do you have, sisters, today in the world in which we live when we have mass genocide? What's happening now in Burma and in Syria? And what's happening now in, um, in so many parts of the world? Or where we have been witnesses, a lot of us witnesses to what happened in Congo, what happened in Rwanda, what continues to happen now in the Philippines. is not just the, the flooding, but the war by the Philippine government against the Muslims of Philippines. A lot of, so many things are happening. And we cannot remain complacent or silent or apathetic in these times. Because history is also a witness. Time is also a witness. And all of these things will be witnesses for us or against us on the Day of Judgment. May Allah make us active. May Allah make us thinkers. May Allah make us of those who want to do something and try and do something and make effort to do something to help other people in the sufferings that they have. And may Allah protect all of us and have mercy on all of us and forgive all of us. And Allah, may Allah make us of those who, who uh, by Allah's mercy, that we would see Fatima. And we would see Khadija and Maryam and Asya. May Allah make us of those who, who may, Allah, may Allah make us their neighbors <laughs> in the next life. <laughs> may Allah make us of those who are neighbors of these great, great people. May Allah make us, uh, may Allah have mercy on all of us. May Allah send His peace and blessings on our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his family and his companions walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen